Ammo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Saranto Suchedoye Hulahuri Samyao Sanputoshe. Namo Saranto Suchedoye Hulahuri Samyao Sanputoshe. Wushang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chien Wan Supreme and Wondrous Dharma, Subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, everyone. My name is Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, July 19th, here in the Gold Coast of Australia. Saturday, July 18th, in California, and we are coming to the end of Cancer, moving into Leo soon, and uh, we're going to be explaining the Vajra Sutra. Um, we are not, that's a mistake. We're going to be explaining the Avatamsaka Sutra today, uh, the Flower Garland Sutra, and we're looking into the Bodhisattva's uh, tenth stage of the ten stages chapter. So let's get right to it. I'll bring up our chanting, and then we're going to return to page 34 and 35 in our text. So here's where we start our process, right there. I'm going to ask a banjo to help us, help us out with the melody. This is a request, but this is an invocation. We're inviting the Avatamsaka Assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to draw near, so. That's the intention. Good to set an intention, that's what we're about. All right, here's the melody. If this were Berkeley, if I were in Berkeley, I would be sitting on the uh, riser at the Berkeley Monastery looking out at the uh, full room of men and women, monks and laity. And then, if we've been successful, then looking out at the gods and the dragons and the eightfold pantheon, spiritual beings and Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who've come to listen to the sutra. Ha! Ah, one might wish, huh? So. That's always, uh, for me, that's a uh, 
highlight of the week is to gather with people who are actually interested in this text, who, who've come because they want to find out more about the Buddha's wisdom, and uh, people who love listening to stories. Um, more and more, I recognize that men and women who speak the Dharma, who, that's our, that's our jargon, right? We speak the Dharma, that's Chinglish, shuo fa, shuo fa, jiang fa, jiang jing shuo fa, de ren. People who explain sutras and speak the Dharma um, are storytellers. And it's a special kind of story that goes deep and it touches places inside us that very few other texts do. And you know which ones they are. Uh, we also use music to enhance it because I think there's actually something neurologically sound in that idea that too many words, too many principles move the left brain, uh, get us into language, into discursive thought, linear ideas, and that we have a capacity for that. And once you fill it up, pretty much we stop listening. We can't do any more lifting with those, those muscles. So along comes music, which is rhythmic. It goes bump, bump, like the heart does. And it also uh, vibrates. So we hear among pentatonic sounds. Uh, that's the the uh, the scale without the thirds, right? The pentatonic scale vibrates elements in the body: earth, water, fire, wood, metal, and helps move the analytical side to digest, to be able to process the principles. So, to say it shortly, it goes down better when we have music. Mm, so, that's, I think, uh, we've pretty much proven that to be the case. And in the sutra itself, what we hear is the Buddha and his disciples chanting to each other. Er shuo ji yue, right? Our song, ji yue, song, song, chang song, first tone, chang song ji yue. The, uh, and then the Bodhisattva chanted this, these verses. And when you hear verses, you know it went ba-bum, 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 or bum, ba-bum, ba-bum, bum, bum, ba-bum, or bum, you see the five, bum, ba-bum, ba-bum, or seven, bum, 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 right? And they did that with music, for sure. Ah, song, fourth tone, thank you. Song, song, ji yue. So it's nice to be able to put that back into the text. It makes it go better. We are coming up, in fact, in fact, uh, we haven't got there yet, but the 10th stage, the, the piece of the text that we're in, has a long, long, long verse section. It's coming up. We won't get there for a couple months, but the verses repeat the prose part. We're now in the prose part telling the long lines, right? The, uh, the grammatical structures into words, sentences, paragraphs. But pretty quick, we get to a place where it's verse. And you'll, back then, when we, when we get to that point, we're going to chant it together. And uh, we'll definitely use our rhythmic uh, aids here. We're gonna use banjos, mandolins, and guitars, so. Alrighty. Are we ready to dive into today's story? Last week it was about dragons, right? Today, it's about dragons. Uh, particularly one is mentioned, but there are, we learned that there are eight major dragon kings, Ba Da Long Wang, who show up in Buddhist texts, okay? I'm gonna read this whole long paragraph and then in Chinese first and in English, and we'll dig into it, see what, it, what we can get out of it, right? Here we go. Starting with Shi Fang Wu Liang Zhu Fo. Shi Fang Wu Liang Zhu Fo, so you, Wu Liang, Da Fa Ming, Da Fa Zhao, Da Fa Yu, Yu Yi Nian Qing, Jie Neng, An Neng Shou, Neng She, Neng Shi, Piru Sa Jie Lo Long Wang, So Shu Da Yu, 
，唯除大海，于一切处，皆不能安，不能受，不能摄，不能持。如来密云藏，大法明，大法照，大法语，以复如是，唯除第十地菩萨。于一切众生、声闻、独觉乃至第九地菩萨，皆不能安，不能受，不能摄，不能持。Which means, roughly, in a single instant of thought, he is able to accept, receive, gather in, and sustain all of the limitless great Dharma clarity, great Dharma illumination, and great Dharma rain. Of limitlessly many Buddhas throughout the ten directions, when the Dragon King Sagara rains down great torrents of rain, only the ocean can accept it all, receive it all, gather it all in, and hold it all. No other places can do so. The great Dharma clarity, the great Dharma illuminations, and the great Dharma rain from the Tathagata's secret treasuries is the same. That's a typo. There is not are. Only the Bodhisattva on the tenth stage can accept it all, receive it all, gather it all in, and hold it all. No other sentient beings, be they voice hearers or prachika Buddhas, up to and including Bodhisattvas of the ninth stage, can do so. Tenth stage Bodhisattva is at the top of his class. He's been studying. She's been studying.、Uh, We don't. The sutra doesn't do chronological age very much. We never hear about. We hear about tonsa. We hear about youth,、uh, but we don't hear so much about、uh, this was an older person or this was a vital, a, a mature person. So how long it takes the bodhisattva to go through first stage, second stage, all the way up to the tenth stage?、Um, there are some hints that it could be lifetimes. Right? It's not. Automatic. It's not quick. It's not. You don't skip steps. This bodhisattva moves because of his or her vows. They want to teach. They want to rescue. They want to save. They want to relieve. They want to heal. They want to shelter living beings who are burning with affliction, who are full of disease, who can't sleep at night because they're worried. Who are obstructed by their pride, or by their lack of pride, lack of confidence, right? All of these afflictions, the bodhisattva says, "That's what I, that's what I want to do." If you say, "Oh, if you do this, you can become a third stage," he'll say, "I don't care what you call it. I need to go out and help this person." Right? They're probably the, the ones that make it to the tenth stage are not there because they wanted the title of tenth stage bodhisattva, but. All of this progress through the various ranks, and it is there's a verticality here. The, the before the bodhisattva made the bodhi resolve, they weren't able to do this. Right? They weren't they weren't able to uh, uh, function at all、uh, with this these benefits, but with these qualities. But they made the bodhi resolve and said.、Um, I want to have the wisdom of the Buddha, and I want to help living beings. So they could more than before. After that Bodhi resolve, they went stage one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And even though we say it was vertical, even though we say、uh, it was, you know,、uh, a linear progression from one up to ten, what was actually going on was not. You, I mean, you could measure it in like graduations, commencement speeches, and mortar boards and diplomas. You could measure it that way, like we do in school with graduation. What was really going on was a reduction in darkness in the bodhisattva's mind. That's what was going on. The bodhisattva was reducing his affliction, his own coverings, his own confusion. Right? That was、uh, disappearing. And so, with that in mind, when we get to the、uh, this, the tenth stage, this bodhisattva is not far from the Buddha in his wisdom. This bodhisattva is bright and clean. Okay, so now at the tenth stage, 
what, what are we talking about? We're hearing about uh, capacity. That's the word. How, the holding ability, right? You saw those verbs, accept, receive, gather in, sustain, things like that. And it says, in a single instant of thought, yinianqing. What is that? We're talking about memory. Memory. And I want to, you know, point to here, the Chinese wouldn't necessarily say that memory is, is held there. It's held, uh, they would put, go here, to point to Xin, you know, where, where, the, where things are, mem- are held in memory. You can re- recall where you don't forget. This Bodhisattva's memory is unsurpassed. He or she is compared to the ocean. That's, that's what we're hearing about now. And there's lots of uh, there's lots of talk about capacity. Okay, now let's see what it says. In a single instant of thought, he or she can four words that mean hold all the limitless great. Now, da fa ming da fa zhao da fa yu. Three things here: big dharma. Ming means clarifications, explanations. Da fa zhao means shining, illuminations, right? So what is it? This bodhisattva is able to um, remember all of the explanations of the Dharma that he or she has heard. From whom? From limitlessly many Buddhas throughout the ten directions. All right. So what are we talking about? When were you last tested for your memory? When was I last tested for my memory? Um, Singing a song, right? Remembering the words, remembering the lyrics of a song. Um, We have, there's this wonderful thing now in the Chinese world called Er Tong, Dujing, here at the Gold Coast Dharma Realm, uh, our Artong Dujing professors are in the room with us today. Looking at you, Richard, you are the person who teaches the kids to memorize, right? So the Master Hua was, uh, let's see, I, I skipped a step here. What is the Artong Du Jing? It's children reciting sutras. Children reciting sutras or classics. Somebody's going to say, uh-oh, you're brainwashing your kids, turning them into little Buddhas, right? No, the Artong Du Jing began with a professor pretty much as identified with Wang Tsai Gui. He was, I believe, a Taiwanese professor who, a professor of classics, teacher of classics, who made it important for children to be exposed to Confucian classics, particularly, but not exclusively. It's just that there is a long, 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 long history of Chinese pedagogy, right? Teaching kids through having, uh, through, let's see, not kids, but students, right? The idea is when you went to school, how you defined education was how well you could memorize the classics. And they were the four books, which are, you know, the Analects, the Doctrine of the Mean, the Zhongyong, right? The Mencius, and uh, and the Great Learning, that's the fourth one. Those are the four Confucian classics. But then you add on to them the, you know, Mengzi, and the, the, you add on the Xiao uh, Jing, and if you go younger, if it's, if it's young children, you have things like the Di Zi Gui, Qian Zi Wen, the San Zi Jing, and the Bai Jia Xing, you know. These are every child traditionally in China until pretty much the 20th century, early Republican period, uh, was trained with what was called the, the uh, hundred family surnames the thousand character, the classic in a thousand characters, the three character classic, and uh, 
the standards for students. These were, this was, this is how you raised a child's mind. This is how you opened up their ability, get their memory working. And education, as I understand, even, you know, in Master Shenhua was kind of the last generation uh, when he was a child to, to go into this, uh, to be immersed in this, was education was the teacher sitting at his desk going with his stick going tap, 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 tap. Like that. And kids had to do that. And if they could, they progressed. If they couldn't, that was their education. Forget it, right? That was it. So on one hand, how boring, how deadly to just recite classics. On the other hand, this is what Professor Wang Tsai Gui learned, was... A little bit of this really sets up a child's mind. And kids, especially before they, before puberty for sure, but even before, you know, eight and nine, young boys and girls from like four, five, six, seven, if they are exposed to these texts and encouraged, can memorize them and bring them back with great accuracy. And then bit by bit, bit by bit, they go, well, what does it mean, right? Ah, and once they ask, what does it mean? Then the parents and the teachers can go, oh, standards for students. These standards for students are guidelines handed down to us by ancient sages. They teach us to practice, they teach us to cherish our elders and practice true brotherhood. Learn to be careful and honest and cherish all living beings. If you have time remaining, apply yourself to your studies, right? That's, that's the first opening of Di Gui that I recited a minute ago. So it's like, and then the kids go, what does that mean? And then the parent, well, what it means is, you know, put your phone away for when you're studying, you know, sit on your phone while you're studying, turn it off and sit on it. Don't touch it, then you can pick it up later. So it's, this has been a, a wonderful way to raise children and the tradition in the typical traditional Chinese family was to value education. And as a result, after 5,000 years, Chinese culture is intact. People, although communism has come in, in, in mainland China and is now you know, part of the scene. But before that, it was a straight line back to the Shang and the Xia dynasty, 5,000 years of Chinese culture one thread and it back in the day you know china was the civilized nation of asia and sent out its influence around the world all over korea japan philippines singapore malaysia without a military aggression it was cultural unity cultural i don't want to say superiority that's not the point but it was this straight line of love of one of culture that allowed these uh the this identity and this knowledge of who you were and science and literature and history and economics and all of those you know aspects of civilization were began with teaching children to memorize and so we saw our teacher master shrenhua uh at age 60 and age 70, when the situation arose for him to recite aloud, he would just like that, just bring it all out, line after line after line after line. And he, uh, his memory, I don't, I don't think people have talked about that very much, but our, our teacher's ability to recite from memory was astonishing, astonishing. Um, I've celebrated uh, his uh, Song of Enlightenment, that he did that in, in Vancouver at Gold Buddha Monastery one day. Uh, after a lecture, during a, a visit for a weekend, he sat back on the sofa and everybody gathered around and it was one of those moments, you know, and we get to chat with our teacher. And Master Hua would, he, he just, for some reason, he just started going, 
君不见，绝下无为先道人；不取妄想，不求真，无名是心，即佛心。幻化空身，即法身；法身教了无为我，本愿自性天真佛。And he continued, and on it went for, you know, twenty-five minutes. And we were all just agog. We'd never had anybody recite anything that long, consistently with great spirit and joy and engagement with the text. And and it was the Song of Enlightenment. And then when he finished, he said, "Anybody who can recite the Song of Enlightenment by memory, any day, that day you will have no affliction." He said. And we're like, "Hand me the book. You know, I want to get started." So,、um, how wonderful! How wonderful indeed that was. And、uh, I, luckily, I had my little Sony Walkman, and I recorded that. So we got to ch- to listen to Shifu chanting "Song of Enlightenment," Zheng Dao Ge, Yong Jia Da Shi Zheng Dao Ge, the the Song of Awakening by Master Yong Jia of the Tang Dynasty. And、uh, so that was just a a, a cupful. Of an ocean of memory that Master Hua had, he memorized medical texts, nine of them. You know, never mind the the, the Analects and the Mencius and the Jung, the Doctrine of the Mean and the Great Learning. He had it all, you know, and that was how you learned. So, okay, that's my story. To refer to today, our Bodhisattva, who in a single instant of thought, now at the peak of his Bodhisattva's powers, the tenth stage. Is able to hold so much dharma from having heard Buddhas explain texts that the only thing that they can compare it to is the ocean, right? The only thing that that holds by comparison, by analogy, is the ocean. Okay, what does the sutra say about the ocean?、It、says when the dragon king Sagara rains down great torrents of rain, only the ocean can accept it, receive it, gather it, and hold it. Nothing else can do it. It'll overflow. There's too much rain coming down from Dragon King Sagara when the earth is doing its part. When the earth is healthy. When this plant. When the world system. Let's use that. The world system is healthy. Okay. Full stop. Who is Sagara? Sagara is the ruler among dragons of the dragon. Palace in the ocean, right? Hai Di Long Gong. This is the place where the Avatamsaka Sutra was held, right? And、uh, when Nagarjuna Bodhisattva went down to get it from the Dragon King's palace, that's where he went. He negotiated with Sagara. Sagara is one of the、uh, ocean-going.、Uh, Dragon kings. There are others, but he's the, the boss, and king, you know, follows this because why? In in the way the Buddhists tell the story, and this is interestingly, you know, last week we did all the apologetics, right? right? Well, some people don't believe in dragons, but some people do believe in dragons, and certainly when you get to the Mahayana, when you get to the real tradition of Buddhism, and we're not talking Zen. Uh, or just mindfulness, where you abstract one practice out of the entire body of the the, the faith, the thousands of years, and let the rest go. In the Chinese Mahayana tradition, the the dragons, the nagas, are all there. We know their names, we know their behaviors, we know their eating habits. Right? I mean, it's like it's intense lore. Stories about dragons, and so, as someone who would aspire to step into the line of Buddhist storytellers, I have a decision to make. It's my choice whether I'm going to apologize and say, "Well, in this, in you know, the 21st century, in the time of science, we uh, uh, we might, if we're going to talk about dragons, we probably want to go to the zoologists." Let's look. You know, maybe look into anthropology or myth mythology. No, don't do that. Don't apologize. Right? This is. 
I don't have to say I, I own it. I don't. I'm relating what the Buddhists say about the spiritual world. And indeed, when you look into the Buddha's own biography, the story lives of the life of the Buddha, he uh, encountered many, 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 many dragons, right? Subdued them. Uh, he was, he dealt with dragons regularly and had dragon disciples, right? So how fascinating that this is not a, not a, even a question about these dragons. And these, now, okay, since uh, the 80s in the United States, this is, we're going into, this is a little bit of a tangent here, but where in our culture do dragons show up? And recently, I'm, by the way, if you're looking at my desktop, uh, that is a common bearded dragon. <laughs> so here in Australia, we have members of the uh, uh, lizard family, right? They're, they're amphibian types who are called dragons, no apology, right? We have water, eastern water dragons and common bearded dragons. And so now the dragons told about in Buddha Dharma, as I say, since the 80s in America, we have had this new phenomenon in our culture called Dungeons and Dragons, D&D. &D. What is Dungeons and Dragons? Well, I was already in my 30s at that point, so uh, it didn't, it went by me. I, was, I wasn't part of that, but young men and women who are now in their 20s and 30s now uh, had a chance when they were growing up to encounter the fantasy world of Dungeons and Dragons. And it was immersion in uh, stories of fantasy creating worlds where dragons were real, right? You, they were mostly fearsome, they mostly sp spewed fire, and they were mostly deadly. Uh, growing up, I had uh, Kenneth Graham, the author, wrote a book called The Reluctant Dragon, and that was a friendly dragon that we, uh, we, we could read about, you know. But by and large, dragons were considered uh, awesome and terrible. You know, you didn't want to have anything to do with a dragon because they, they were huge and they were, had bad tempers. And, and uh, now, uh, in, since, the, uh, since the world of Dungeons and Dragons arose among our youth, uh, it's, dragons have now kind of reinserted themselves, but they're all contained in fantasy. It's considered just the imagination, and it's good stories, right? Um, there is now, there are, because of that, there has been a rise of fantasy literature. Um, and there are some, Naomi Novik is a favorite author of mine who writes about Temeraire, the, the uh, dragons who are, it's the Napoleonic era, and the British Navy has, an, has a, a fleet of combat dragons right? And uh, so Naomi Novik writes these great, they're really well written, as if we were uh, back in the Napoleonic era with pilots who were trained to, to fly on dragons as part of a military exploit. So Western culture uh, makes them fictional, but that's better than non-existent, or just to say, oh, that's, you know, you're just a sky pilot, airy-fairy nonsense. When we get to the Buddha's world, here we are talking about Sagara, the dragon king, who is what? He's in charge of the rain. His job as a ocean, king of the ocean-going dragons is to regulate the weather. The dragon is a weather man. He's a weather beast, right? So the dragons belong to the animal realm, but they're not only, they are spiritual beings. Here is a king, he is awesome. If the dragon appeared, you would probably be on your knees asking him to please spare your life, you know. So the, they say that uh, dragons can have spiritual powers, they can have psychic powers. They aren't good at holding the precepts. So that's one of the issues of being a dragon. 
Um, as Master Hua would tell us, uh, coincidentally, he said one of the other issues of being a dragon, and just in case anybody was thinking, cool, I want to be a dragon, one of the issues is dragons have an affliction called sand in the scales, and they come down to the beach and rub their, their scales in the sand to polish, and the sand gets in under the scales and it irritates, <laughs> said Master Hua. So it's something you learn if you have dragon disciples. So it's not all copacetic. If you're a drag, if you're a, a earth traveling dragon, you don't want to get sand under your scales because it's itchy. So mm. you heard it here. That's all right, and that's okay. I don't charge extra for that bit of information. So Dragon King Sagara. What else about him? There's more that we know about the Dragon King Sagara, which is that. The, there is a, a, a dragon girl, a dragon maiden, who is celebrated in, among the Lotus Sutra stories. And what is it about uh, the dragon maiden is she shows up and is willing to trade in to let go of her pearl, her precious baozhu, ruizhu, her precious pearl, in exchange for cultivation to Buddhahood. And the, the deal is, the other piece of lore that we need to know is that dragons are very attached to their pearls. And that's every time you see an image, you see the dragon with his pearl. And these pearls are the focus of their lives because there's that's probably where the psychic powers come from, perhaps, I don't know. She the dragon maiden says, I will offer my pearl to the Buddha. I'll let it go. And the Buddha goes, ah, all of you arhats who are pleased with your purity, take a look at this young woman. She is able to let go of the things she values the most in order to succeed in her cultivation. She will become a Buddha from a female body. Oh, this upsets the arhats in the story. This is in the Buddha's biography. The arhats go, wait a minute, that just breaks all the rules. First of all, women don't become Buddha. Second of all, she's a kid. How can she become a Buddha? We have been cultivating alone. Blah, 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 blah. Right? And the Buddha says, you just not. She's able to let it go, set it down. Nangsha, nangsha, nangsha. She can let go of what's hard to let go of. Can you? He says to his disciples. And sure enough, the dragon girl gets a prediction to Buddhahood, and she accomplishes it before their eyes, right? Now, who is the dragon girl? She is the third royal princess, daughter of Sagara, the dragon king. So, Sagara, the dragon king, is a proud daddy of a young girl who's on her way to Buddhahood, his daughter. So, how about that? Yeah, yeah. Here's another, here's another image. Can people see this? Here's a dragon. This is a uh, close-up of a common bearded dragon taken by my camera here at Penogan, Queensland. How about that? So yeah, all right. Sagara has a lot going for him and the text goes on. The great clarifications of Dharma and the great explanations of Dharma that make up this Dharma reign are the same. The Dharma reign from the Buddha's secret treasury. Mm. So there are things that Buddhas alone know. Only the Bodhisattva on the tenth stage can accept it, receive it, gather it in, and hold it all. No other sentient beings, sound hearers, voice hearers, Pracheka Buddhas, Bodhisattvas of the ninth stage can do so, right? He has this capacity. All right, what were we talking about just a minute ago? Memory. This is talking about the Bodhisattva's ability to bring back when he needs it all the teachings he's heard. He doesn't forget when the Buddha speaks Dharma when he hears it from a dragon girl, 
right? A dragon maiden. This bodhisattva can take it all in and bring it back. Um, I have friends who studied Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine uh, in Oakland and San Francisco. If we take the Bay Area altogether, uh, I believe there are, somebody can correct me, if Locke is on, he'll correct me. There are uh, half a dozen accredited schools of Chinese medicine in the Bay Area. I think Oakland had three at one point. And they have connections with Chinese medical schools, schools of Chinese medicine in China, and the faculty all get their, uh, their students because of the reputation. So-and-so's grandfather was the final physician for the last emperor of China, etc. So in the world of Chinese medicine, my, my friends describe what it's like to be a student of some of these great Chinese physicians. And they say there's just no way you can hold it all. Uh, there are how many meridians that, that we have to memorize? There are how many acupuncture points, 1,000, on the body? You have to know them all by name. Uh, if, you, if you take the pulses on a patient and there's multiple pulses up and down the wrist here, and you balance those out with the weather, with the date, with this person's previous medical history, with anything they might be allergic to, with, okay, you keep adjusting and adjusting to get the elements balanced, and then you prescribe what this, the herbs this person needs to reharmonize, to rebalance their constitution. Where does the needle go, and how do you, you know, tweak it to make it work? Do you suppress or do you excite the element to make it balance, right? All these things to be a Chinese doctor have to be memorized, right? It's very organic, very hands-on, hands-on literally, your hand touching that person's living pulse, not the pulse in the blood vessels going through the wrist, but the pulse of the qi going through the meridians. It all is available to now, Ayurveda physicians in India, I saw Dr. Vasant Lad uh, do pulse diagnosis. He took both wrists of the individual, of the patient. He would hold like this. And it's just the way, you know, a guitarist is fretting the strings or a pianist is playing the keys. The, Dr. Ladd would go, like that. And then he would go, okay, uh, you, your... Uh, your guna, your fire, your pitta. Your pitta is pushing your vata. You need to make sure the pitta and vata are balanced, you know. And same thing, you know. All of that knowledge has to be absorbed before you are an effective physician. It's not just popping needles into people's skin. Uh, so Master Hua, right, he memorized nine medical texts. And then what did he do? He said, I don't want to be a physician. If I prescribed wrong for a single person so that I harmed them, so that they died, I would never forgive myself. He said, I would rather be a Dharma doctor because even the best of physicians at some point has to lie down and go off to rebirth. So if I can learn the Dharma medicine, then I will be a true healer and be able to help even doctors, right? So he said uh, that was his decision to not be a doctor after learning so much about medicine. And uh, he considered you know, being a physician at one point, but then decided to become a monk instead to our benefit, lasting benefit. And uh, there's, a great, there's a great joke, one of my few Dharma jokes. 
So King Yama, the king of the underworld is sick and uh, so he, he dispatches one of his wardens from the hells, the, the purgatory realm. He says, uh, he says, go on out and uh, find me a doctor who I, who I can consult with and tell me what's wrong with me. So uh, uh, the, uh, the warden goes out and uh, they, he goes out with a friend. The two of them are looking and they go to one doctor and they notice there's like hundreds of ghosts around this doctor's door. And they're all wailing and, you know, will you owe me? Oh, that's a bad doctor. We won't, we're not going to recommend our teacher to this one. So they go to the next doctor and he's got 50 ghosts around the door. And the ghosts are all, you know, you upset because the doctor misdiagnosed and misprescribed, you know. And they go to the third one, there's 25 ghosts outside the door. And they're, wow, aren't there any doctors who are reliable? And they finally go to the, this, this last one. And there's the doctor, he's got a shingle out, you know, doctor so-and-so. And they go, oh, terrific. Oh, that's great. And, oh, look, there's the doctor. So they say, uh, uh, could you tell us uh, about your practice? And they say, how long have you been a doctor? He says, this is my first day. <laughs> Oh no. So they have to go back and tell King Yama that he has to take his chances. So, so yeah, uh, the, uh, the amount of memorization required to become a traditional physician is intense, right? Even medical school, you have to learn the names of the bones and the names of the herbs and all that and the combinations. And so here is our bodhisattva who is concerned that he learns all the dharma that he's heard from the Buddhas and his teachers. So in order to compare it to something that we know, they compare it to the king of dragons who is in charge of the rain, right? So the rain never overflows the ocean the ocean can hold all the rain. The Dharma heard and spoken never overflows the mind of the 10th stage Bodhisattva. His memory can hold it all. Got it? That's our point. All right, next paragraph, moving on down. We're now at Fodzi Piru. Okay, here we go. Fodzi Piru Da Hai Nung An Nung Shou Nung She Nung Chi. Yi 一切一佛法明法照法语若二若三乃至五量 uh, and let's see we're, we'll stop right there that's, that's good for now disciples of the Buddha by analogy the ocean can accept receive gather in and hold all the great torrents of rain poured down by a single dragon king or by two of them or by three of them up to and including being able in a single moment of thought to accept, receive, gather in, and hold all the torrents of rain poured down simultaneously by all the limitlessly many dragon kings. Why is it so? Because the ocean is a container with limitless capacity. And the bodhisattva who abides on the stage of the Dharma cloud is that way as well. Okay, so there's our picture What's going on? Metaphor time. Hmm. It's analogy time. We don't know what, it, what the Bodhisattva on the 10th stage's memory is like, so it gives us a picture of Sagara, the Dragon King. And it says, yep, he can rain down a lot of rain. The ocean can hold it. Then it says, he's just one Dragon King. If there's two, if there's three, or many more, 
in a single moment of thought, the ocean can accept, receive, gather in, and hold all their rain. Why? Because, it says, the ocean is a container with limitless capacity. What's it say? It's a big container. Okay. The bodhisattva who abides on the stage of the Dharma cloud is the same way. He can hold lots of Dharma. All right. So, this is really interesting in that memory is, is the same for everyone. Anybody who uh, has ever spent a day in a classroom, so anybody, any kid who's ever gone to school, and that's most of us, I'm assuming, we, we left at various points along the way, but at some point we were in a classroom, and the teacher was trying to communicate knowledge, trying to give us stuff we didn't know. And we listened to some of it, and it went, oh, yeah, that's wonderful. That really makes, I get it. You know, I want to learn more. We heard some of it, and we went, till, no comprende, senor. Sorry, didn't, didn't get it, right? Me, mathematics, that was me. I didn't get mathematics. So, uh, you know, foreign language. Oh man, foreign language is remembering. You remember, that's how you say, you know, how you say dragon. How do you say dragon in Spanish? Dragon. dragon. French, the same, the dragon. Yeah. So, in Chinese, it's long. And did you, how long, how much of your education uh, you say, hinged on your memory. Boy, oh boy, one of the big, big reasons why I stopped drinking alcohol even before I got close to the Buddhist precepts was because the effect of alcohol on my memory. I could just feel it. Drink a beer and that alcohol in my bloodstream just made memory go away. And I didn't mind, I was you know, drinking beer to have fun with friends and stuff, and to, I was looking for the hoo hoo hoo, you know, so I didn't have to remember things that I was hoping to forget quickly, right? But man oh man, what, uh, what an impact that uh, uh, alcohol had on my clarity, on my memory. So here's, you know, um, I want to make a point here about my own experience in Buddhism. I started out in Zen, Zazen, Japanese Chan, Japanese Zen. And I was in the line of, of uh, Dogen and <coughs> the Soto school. And it came down to me through... Uh, a teacher named Uchiyama Kosho, and his teacher was Sawaki Kodo. And these, these were strong uh, holders of the line in the 20th century of Dogen in the Soto school. And the things that they valued were what's called Shikan Taza, Zhiguan Dazuo, only worry about your sitting. Now, Uchiyama did more than that, though. He was a great speaker. And while my Japanese was not enough to be able to benefit directly, I got some translations and I would pick up on his body language and on the tone and all, and uh, his kindness. But he was one, he, he was very much into taking the experience of sitting, of Zazen, and applying it to the world. Many of the teachers of Japanese Zen do not do that. You only worry about your sitting. And they say, just sit all the time. Practice, practice, is the word they practice. So I grew up in that part of my Buddhist training thinking that that was all there was. 
anything that I learned had to come out, it had to come from opening my mind. There was nothing going this way in the Dharma. Now, um, who else taught that way? A large part, to a large part, was Ajahn Chah, the beloved Thai forest patriarch, Ajahn Chah, who was the teacher of Ajahn Sumedho and Ajahn Pasano and Ajahn Amaro and, and uh, Munindo and all of the, that generation of bhikkhus. Ajahn Chah was, he, there were, this, there, he wasn't anti-intellectual at all. It's that at the time that Ajahn Chah was teaching the Thai forest tradition, um, there was, Buddhism had already uh, shown the tendency in Thailand to become corrupt. And Ajahn Chah was trying to, to support practice from the bottom. And there, there was another movement in Thai Buddhism to go purely to intellectual discussion of the Abhidharma and stuff and forget your roots and sitting. So he was another one who emphasized, get what you, what you need from your practice. Okay, so I'm telling you these, about these highlights in my Buddhist experience, having been exposed to the Soto school in Kyoto and then my friendship with Ajahn Sumedho, Ajahn Pasano, Ajahn Amaro, and Ajahn Sudanto, and, and, and Ajahn Kurundammo, and, and all of the, the bhikkhus from uh, the Amravati and Abhagiri lineage, they uniformly, one is Japanese, one is Thai, one is Mahayana, one is Theravada, they uniformly encouraged practice over learning. When I got to Gold Mountain Monastery, Master Shrenhua said, you need to hear the Buddha's voice. We want the Buddha's voice to be heard in this country speaking English. So please get to work translating. I will explain it in my Chinese. I will tell you these stories. I will pass them on, but you need to make them yours. You need to integrate them into your culture. You need to make sense of them. Take them as shoes that you put on your feet and walk in. Take them as a mirror that you see the reflection of your true face in. Take them as a blueprint that you learn to build accurately the uh, structures of your life around these principles. Then I will feel like I've done my job, said Master Hua. So, we went to school with learning the Dharma from Master Hua. And because of the breadth of his background and his own tradition, learning the Dharma included learning about Confucius. Learning the Dharma included learning about filiality. Learning the Dharma included learning about being a better person, a better citizen, right? a better father, son, wife, daughter, husband, child, you know, relationships were on display every day, how to be a better person. And who knew, right? This was all clearly Master Hua uh, saw our state of culture in America, North America in particular, in this the latter end of the 20th century and said, you guys need to learn. You gotta, it has to come in this way. It's not all going to come from your sitting. If you just sit, you're basically rehearsing, refreshing your own prejudices and biases and, and bigotry and ignorance. Once your meditation starts to work, then of course the, you reverse the process. You're not confirming your ignorance, lack of light, you're re transforming it into bodhi, into awakening. But meanwhile, you all have to absorb this way. So by day, we heard about Confucius. By night, we heard about the Buddha. Education, he said, is how we're bringing the Dharma into the West. So how, how amazing was that, right? So in that process, your mind did not go to sleep. You had to use your memory. You had to hone 
your intellectual discriminative powers. And then, right on top of that, he would say, don't have so many false thoughts, right? So it's like, but Shervo, you're teaching us all. Yeah, that's right. And you have to find the principle. If you find the principle, where's the principle? In your nature. Find the principle, that's the root. The branch tips will take care of themselves. You chase branch tips around and you're never going to get back to the root. You won't, it won't be yours. You'll just be parroting what other people say. So it's like, that's so hard, Shervo. Right, not easy, is it? That's why having a human body is a blessing. You should make the most of it, right? There are so many people who need this wisdom. You need to learn it and then go teach it. Bring forth the great Bodhi resolve to teach living beings. And so we're like spinning, you know. Shurfu, you tell us all this information, then you say don't have false thoughts. Shurfu, you tell us to meditate so we can become Buddhas, but then we have to, you know, recite the Song of Enlightenment. You say, yeah, that's right. This is how, how one learns, you know. And then he would turn it into a joke and he would make us laugh and then he would start reciting and you just get so inspired by, by the accomplishments of this, this Buddhist monk who ate one meal a day and wore the same clothes for 10 years, you know. And then, yeah, look at what it, how one can live. Life can include all of this. How amazing. How amazing. So, uh, the other thing was, Master Hua was also an artist, and I wanted to share something that came to me today. Uh, this is a picture of Ali, the kookaburra, painted by Emily. How nice. So, this tradition of... of Arts in the Dharma is continuing. How about that? That's the expression. That's the attitude of the kookaburra landing on the rail. Got some breakfast for me? Mm. How cute. All right. Now, uh, what about, we, have, we heard about Sagara, the Dragon King. Um, I went digging through Master Hua's biography stories to find the story of Dragon Rain Cottage. Fa Yu Maopeng, Fa Yu Jingshu. And it turns out that, that uh, Master Hua in Manchuria, back in the early days, had a disciple named Guo Shun. And Guo Shun uh, was a real cultivator. He could actually rule Ding. He could enter Samadhi, right? And uh, so he, uh, he, he built this Malpunk, this hut. Uh, I don't know how big it was, but it was big enough that he uh, invited his teacher to come and dedicate it to Kai Guang. And so Master Hua showed up with three or four disciples, and they did the, you know, the things you do when you st when you kind of inaugurate a new structure a new place where Dharma will be practiced. And uh, they were spending the night, because it's a long way to travel, and 10 dragon kings showed up at night to talk to Master Shen Hua. And the, they said, we want to take refuge with you would you please accept us as your disciples? And so Master Hua said, uh, let me see here. He said, the job of the Dragon King is to make it rain. How come we're going through a drought here in northeastern China? And uh, so the Dragon Kings they had a spokesperson, and the Dragon King said to Master Hua, well, it's not our decision. The Jade Emperor is our boss. We can't make it rain unless he says go. So Sri Hua said, uh-huh, all right. So you're passing the buck, huh? Passing the responsibility, okay. Here's the deal. He said, you want to be disciples of the three, the Sun Bao, the three jewels? Um, go tell your boss that if it rains within 40 miles of Dragon 
of our cottage here. Uh, by tomorrow, I'll allow you to take refuge. And so, sure enough, yesterday, on the spot, or yes, the next day, on the spot, in a radius of 40 miles, it rained abundantly. And beyond the 40 miles, it didn't rain. Just exactly, precisely that far away. And so the dragons came back and said, we uh, cashed in some blessings, and he agreed, and so there's the rain. So Master Hua said, good, all right. Uh, your name will be Ji Xiu and Kuai Du, quickly cultivating and rapidly crossing over. He said, use those names as you spread the Dharma among your dragon friends and relatives. And so ever since then, they took refuge. Those dragons have uh, followed Master Hua and his disciples. So last week I told the story of... Uh, an unusual, inexplicable experience that I had personally um, while bowing to the city of 10,000 Buddhas where a major storm soaked California in 1977 for three months, uh, three days, that is to say. And uh, the 18-wheeler, you know, semi-trailers, trucks were blown off the highway. Uh, it was the, the roads were highways were just shut because it was raining so hard. But where we were bowing was, we had no idea. There was no rain. We didn't see anybody for three days. We only found out that it was because the highway was blocked. Nobody could get to us. Uh, and so we just kept our bowing quietly. And it seemed calm where we were. And then when Master Hua came out three days later, he said, whoa, he said, uh, I just wanted to check and see my disciples had been washed into the ocean. And he looked up and said that there's this hole in the clouds overhead. You, you guess you didn't notice it, right? Good. Don't have so much false thinking about it. So I didn't tell you. He said those, that hole, that donut in the sky, he said, is because you don't fight. He said, as soon as you fight, that'll close and it'll rain like the blazes here. It'll rain like, like a waterfall. But because you don't talk, therefore you don't argue with him, and the dragons can come and do their job, he said. So we're going, sure, dragons? What? No, no, don't fall think about it. Just do your job, you know. We're like, what? Where? You know. So that's my own experience. Um, I have a, uh, another story that came to us today. We, we had a, the blessing of... Uh, Stella and Mimi, two of Master Hua's old disciples from, uh, disciples from Hong Kong, back when he was from 1949 to 1962, uh, 12 years, he was in Hong Kong. And there was a story about uh, Master Hua's monastery called Shi Le Yuan. Shi Le Yuan. So Western Bliss Gardens, and it was on a part of Hong Kong that is, it was on a mountainside, very steep and uh, dry also, because it was rock mostly. Hong Kong is just a rocky island coming out of the sea and then the area around it with islands. So um, Master Hua, this was a 1954, he had planted bamboos and mangoes and papayas and other kinds of fruit trees in, uh, in, his, in, in the, the area of the temple. And a typhoon blew in and uprooted. Typhoons in Hong Kong at the time were just fierce. Oh my goodness. They were, you know, when the typhoon would blow, uh, it would uproot trees. And sure enough, it happened that all of his carefully planted fruit orchards blew down the roots were exposed, and so Master Hua uh, said to one of his disciples, he said, all right, he said, that's it. From now on, no more typhoons. And he said, I can tell Yu Huang Dadi, he said, the Jade Emperor, if it rains like 
that if a typhoon threatens the good people of Hong Kong. He said, I'm going to be, not going to be polite to you, he said. So it's like, here's Master Hua threatening the Jade Emperor, you know, it's like, he said, no, he said, I just don't want to see all these citizens of Hong Kong suffering because you're not doing your job, you're not paying attention here. So interestingly enough, that was recorded by half a dozen Master Hua's disciples. And for the next decade, for the next 10 years, Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong was spared from the typhoons that until that year had regularly blown in. And they say, you know, Chu Feng Shi Gang, they say that Hong Kong got washed away by the typhoon. They stopped. They would approach and then veer off to the south or to the north, but they didn't hit Hong Kong. And then, in uh, 1961, 1960, uh, Sherfu came here to Australia. And sure enough, once he left, check the records, 1960, a huge typhoon blew in to, to wash Hong Kong. And uh, that's, that's an amazing synchronicity, or what, what do you call that? How, you know, and are we claiming that our teacher controls the weather? I'm passing on fact. This this happened, and it's, it's way beyond my comprehension. But I will guarantee you that such a thing did take place. And in America, uh, Master Hua talked to his dragon disciples once again, and said, "As long as I am in." the Bay Area, as long as I'm in San Francisco, one day, that's one day we were not gonna let the earthquake. And this was a time from the early 60s on, uh, Hong Kong was, or, I'm sorry, San Francisco was called the city that waits to die, right? So the, earth, the great earthquake has been predicted for decades now. And the, it was mostly talked about the San Andreas Fault, but then the talk about the, the Hayward Fault. The Hayward Fault regularly quaked every 120 some years. And the seismologists, many of whom are friends of ours, went down and they dug and they dug and they found the carbon record where, yes, 120 years ago, Hayward had an 8.0 earthquake, you know, major earthquake. And so that cycle was up. It was supposed to quake again. San Francisco, the great earthquake of 1908, you know, and uh, the fires that followed it. Well, it was due again. And everybody was from the soothsayers to the astrologers to the, to the seismologists were all saying, it's gonna happen, the big one is coming. Master Hua said, since 1962, I've been here in the Bay Area, and now we are, we've, op we've begun our Avatamsaka Dharma assembly, he said. We are turning the Avatamsaka Dharma wheel, and we're not going to let this assembly fall into the Pacific Ocean. We're not going to let the earthquake. And people are going, did I hear you correctly? You know, you're saying you're not going to let the earthquake? Yeah, that's correct. We're not going to let the earthquake. And it didn't, you know. There's a book by a man named Vaughn, an author uh, called Patterns of Prophecy. And uh, I have a copy. And he said, now, in the, among the Buddhist world, we have the Master Shrenhua of Gold Mountain Monastery, who says that as long as he is in California one day, the earth won't quake. He said, uh, that's a remarkable claim, and you can be skeptical if you want, but I know a lot of people in San Francisco who regularly check to see if Master Shrenhua is still in San Francisco because they don't want to they don't want to find out that he's left too late. And so uh, those predictions keep coming. We traveled with Master Shrenhua to Taiwan in 1989 and Remember, we landed in Taipei, and then our nuns were in Zhengfa uh, Fo Shiyuan in Hualien. 
at a place called Dongjing Monastery, Dongjing Monastery, Dongjing Si. And we arrived at Dongjing Si, and I remember we just finished eating our first lunch, and we were resting upstairs, and this layman came running upstairs, running out of breath, and said, Shifu, Shifu, Jin Shan Da Di Zhen, he said. San Francisco just had a major earthquake. And Shifu went, oh, he said, I forgot, <laughs> he said. He said, I didn't give the instructions for when I left. He said, as soon as I left San Francisco, the demon king dropped his hammer. And so he got on the airplane and flew back to San Francisco and uh, then returned to Taiwan a week later. All the time he was fasting, interestingly. He was not eating during this entire episode. Uh, he periodically fasted. But, you know, we were going, wait a minute, Shurfu, you said any day that you're in San Francisco, the earth won't quake, and as soon as you left to go to Taiwan, there was an earthquake? Yeah, he says, I should have, should have been more careful. My, my mistake, my bad, he said. So we're like, <laughs> what is going on? How is this? So, all right, I'm just relating my experience, right? This is in my, and I grew up scientifically educated. This is dragons and earthquakes and rainfall was not, dragons didn't control the rain when I, you know. So, uh, 1976, major drought in California, seven years, big drought, right? And it was impacting everything, people were, really suffering. And then the, the, the mantra that we learned was about flushing a toilet. Everybody took a big brick and put it in the tank of their toilet to reduce the water so that every, with every flush of your toilet, you would use less water. That's how serious it was. We were rationing toilet flushes, right? So the mantra was, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down, right? <laughs> Thinking of how you use your toilet. So if you, if, it's, if you just pee in the toilet, you don't flush it. Let it sit for a while. I was trying to save water. So um, somebody said, Shurfu, we've read that in Buddhism, there is this dharma of praying for rain, asking the dragons for rain. How does it work? And he said, oh, well, I'm glad somebody finally asked me. I was kind of waiting for you to ask me. So we looked in a book called the Chan Man Er Song, the, uh, the daily ceremonies of the Chan school. And there is a qi uh, ceremony requesting rain. And it's aimed at the dragon kings. So we said, sure, but we read about you and the dragons and you have disciples, Ji Xiu and Kwai Du from Dragon Rain Cottage. And, and uh, in Hong Kong, you kept the typhoons away and the dragons, you know them, Shifu, could tell us what to do. So he said, all right, good, glad you asked. You have to request dharma. You don't hit people over the head with dharma. So now you've asked, I'll tell you what to do. He said, why don't you go out in Golden Gate Park? Set up an altar. You can bring one of our Buddha images, and wooden fish and the bell, and uh, follow the ceremony here in the Chanman or so. He said, so, okay, so we did. Um, we went out in the morning, dry, it was really dry. We went to the, uh, the buffalo, uh, what's the, the meadow, there's a meadow right in Golden Gate Park, where the, next to the, where the buffalo live, buffalo pens. And we put out the table and got in line and we had printed out the ceremony and there's lots of curious hippies and, and uh, lookers, passers-by, onlookers. And we said, here, you know, you want to join us? So we recited Guanyin's name and certain praises, and we started reciting the Great Compassion Mantra. Da Bei Zhou, Nam Mo He La Da No Do La Ye Ye. And uh, so we went on, and then it was lunchtime, and we went to the, uh, the Golden Gate Park band shell, which people know is over by the aquarium. And we had a lunch there in Dharma Talks, and I... I have, I have, there's a picture of me with a guitar singing, when the rains come, they run and hide their heads. They might as well be dead when the rains come. Singing that, somebody forced me into doing that. 
Bhikshuni Hangin, Hangin, uh, not the current Bhikshuni Hangin, former Bhikshuni Hangin, uh, sang songs, sang Dharma songs. We went back out to the to the uh, uh, the the meadow and did an afternoon of ceremonies. And at four o'clock, I have to say, it was overcast. Clouds came in, and we're all going like, "Don't look! Don't look! Don't 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 jinx it! Right? Pretend nothing's different! Don't look!" So we finished. We transferred the merit according to the book to the dragons and uh, came back to Gold Mountain Monastery and it was going blip, 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 blip. Raindrops were falling in San Francisco and uh, it started to rain. And oh my God, we were looking, you know, where's Sherfu? Does, did, does Sherfu, has he been doing this, you know? And so, okay, somebody, a layman, came running in and said, did you see the news? And we said, no, we don't have a TV. He said, I brought my portable TV, plug it in, ran up the antenna, and he said, wait for the next news cycle. So at like six o'clock, here was uh, KPIX, I think, you know, or Channel 4, whoever it was, K-R-O-N, K-R-O-N, uh, and here was the reporter, and she said, uh, now, I, I know some of you might feel this is rather superstitious, but I must say, she had an umbrella over her head. She said, San, Francisco's, San Franciscans are happy today because it rained for the first time in years. We are standing where the Buddhists did their ceremonies here. And we have to say, whatever you did, it worked, you know? And she, she's standing in a puddle of rain and with the rain and an umbrella. So that was like, Wow, we, we, did we make it rain? You know, you don't dare make that claim. But sure enough, after recited the Great Compassion Mantra and uh, did it rufa, according to Dharma, sure enough, you know, that's very interesting. So that's my own experience. There are uh, people who will confirm who were there. Bhikshuni Hung Xian was part of the group. Uh, Richard Josephson, former Bhikshu Hong Kong, was part of the group, and uh, that's that's what happened. How interesting! So um, I've got one more uh, dragon and rain story, and what is? Let's let's before we get to this last story. Um, what are the principles here? The uh, principle is that there's more to the world than our six senses report to us. As scientists, what do scientists do? Scientists ask questions. They measure, they compare, they investigate. Right? Science is, is a question. It's not an answer. Any answer is quickly replaced by another answer as soon as you learn more. That's the, the beauty of science is it wants to know. And once it gets a principle, then you can know more, right? So here is what by our definition is a scientific spirited text, the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra, that exists only to communicate knowledge to people who want to do what the Buddha did. It's a how-to, it's instructions, right? And our sutra, our scientific textbook, talks about dragons. That's a principle that says, yep, in the world of spiritual beings, dragons matter. It's, it's, a, it's very factual. It's very matter of fact. There's no speculation. There's no, you know, secret passed on. If you pay me enough, I'll give you the secret transmission. It's not. It says, no, the dragon king makes it rain. Okay? What do you do with that? What do I do with that? Is it, you know, is, 
I, I went through a long period of where I couldn't say that out loud at the wrong time, or the wrong place, or the wrong ears. People would laugh, you know. But then you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't be so sure. The amount that we know compared to all that can be known is not, wouldn't fill a thimble, right? So that's where we are right now, is learning about dragons. By what? What's, what's the sutra talking about? Memory. The tenth stage bodhisattva has a capacity to hold all the dharma that the Buddha can speak the way the ocean can hold all the rain that dragon kings can, following the orders of <laughs> the Jade Emperor, can rain down and it'll never overflow. The ocean can contain it all. Bodhisattvas on the 10th stage can hold all the Dharma in the same way. That's our principle. Okay? There we go. Spiritual animals, magical animals, dragons. And they're, they are also on the path of cultivation. Why do the dragons hang around the Buddha? It's because they want to be like him. They are limited by their bodies, which are not so great, right? They share a resemblance to snakes that dragons don't like, but they're, it's true that their karma brings them back into animals' bodies, but their spiritual natures are highly developed and able to manifest strange psychic powers. There's the story of the sixth patriarch who trapped a dragon in his bowl by, a, by tricking it because of its pride, right? So there's, that's a story from the Tang Dynasty. I will share one more story, and then we're going to um, transfer the merit. Um, in a minute, uh, I'm going to ask Jin Chuan sure to show us, if you will, that poster of the Vedanta Society. But here's here's my story. In our community, we have uh, sincere cultivators. And I, I won't mention her name because she'd be embarrassed. She doesn't like to have her name mentioned. But it's uh, one of our sisters who lives in the East Bay. And she has uh, a, her daily gongke, her practices would make many monastics embarrassed because she's hardworking. She works very hard with her practice. And at the Berkeley Monastery, we were about to begin the Earth Store Bodhisattva, Earth Treasury Bodhisattva Sutra lecture series. We had finished one of the Avatamsaka chapters and we were going for the next sutra, which is Earth Store, Dizang Jing. And just before we began, this uh, uh, laywoman came in and she was really excited. And this is someone who talks very little, doesn't talk very much. She just she prefers to let her deeds, you know, speak. So we're about to begin the lecture and she raises her hand from the balcony. And I said, yeah, uh, I won't say her name. And she said, or her translates as flower, right? So flower says this, uh, sure, Fasher, I finished reciting Restore Sutra and uh, it kind of like a dream, but it wasn't really a dream. Can I tell it? Tell you what it was? I said, yeah, sure. What was it? She said, "Well, I saw all these dragons." She said, and they were like moving in front of me. There were so many. Some were really, really big. Some were tiny, but many. Lots of little ones. Some were silver. Some were green. Some were red. Some were brown. And, you know, they were all going, and I reached out my hand, and I touched one. <laughs> he said, I felt the scales, and they were cool and, and smooth. And I said, what are you all doing? Where are you going? Why is everybody going in that way? And he answered me, and he said, have you heard? Someone's going to be explaining the Urstor Sutra. We're going to go on tent. We don't want to be late. So <laughs> she said, Oh, okay, thanks. And they all continued by. And she said, yeah, I just 
just wanted to tell you that. And we're like, okay, what do you do with that? <laughs> so, my goodness, what do you do with that? So, okay, we, what we don't know is so much more than what is knowable, what we know, that it's lifelong learning. That was Master Hua's style, lifelong learning. Right. Yeah. Can we, let's see, oh, you know what? We've been doing, uh, this is a new thing we've got going here, which is instead of dedication of merit, we have been transferring merit with the uh, Medicine Buddha Mantra. And some people say, yeah, but that's not a transference. Um, correct, it's not a traditional transference. However, um, there are many transferences, many different ways of doing it. And they have different purposes, they have different uh, functions. So we will, the real heart of transference happens in our mind, happens with our thoughts. So let's make wishes with our thoughts to transfer the merit however you would like it done, however you would like to make that happen, right? What do you want to do with all the goodness that comes from listening to these old stories and some new stories, right? How do you, uh, what do you do with that uh, merit? Um, the answer is uh, whatever you want. How do you want to transfer it? It's up to you. You can do it. Uh, so once you set that intention, however far your mind can go, that's what happens. That's, that's the job of transference. Now, we do it with a verse to bring everybody's kind of thoughts together, but the verse is totally flexible and adaptable. So in this case, uh, being that we're in a pandemic season, um, let's do a transference that's aimed at healing from Medicine Buddha. We do it in Sanskrit. It's got some energy there. Arhat 
Jate Samyak Sambuddha Hayam Ajata Om Last chance, here we go. My Sajje My Sajje My Sajja Sambuddhate Swaha Alrighty, here's that announcement that I wanted to share with everybody. We'll click right here and tomorrow, tomorrow late afternoon in California and that would be tomorrow morning early um, here in Australia when most people are going to work. There's going to be a lecture. Let's see here. at the Vedanta Society of Berkeley. The Vedanta monks, the Ramakrishna mission, friends of ours have invited me to give a lecture uh, through their auspices on Zoom. And it's called A Buddhist's Perspective on this scenario of new normal, right? I'm gonna talk about what monastic communities contribute to the world. Uh, because the Ramakrishna monks, the Vedanta uh, community of swamis, are, are good friends. And uh, let's see here. Click event poster, link with PDF. I don't know where that is. Oh, event poster, I see. There it is. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is our poster. There it is. Um, we are celibate monastics with long, long histories of the order surviving and over those years, we've learned uh, how to sustain communities living in the world. So I want to share uh, some ideas from that experience with friends, anyone who wants to join in. Uh, here, there's a Zoom link and the meeting ID there. So that is going to happen tomorrow. Uh, it's 10.30 here in the morning, and it'll be 8.30 a.m. in Taiwan or Hong Kong, China. Um, people can listen in Zoom. It'll be in English, uh, so that's one of the conditions. I hope you'll join us. Look forward to being uh, sharing the good news with uh, Swami Prasanatmananda and the friends at the Berkeley Vedanta Society. All right. Uh, any announcements from the Berkeley Monastery? Anything people need to know? I don't think so. I think we're actually we do have the Great Compassion Mantra recitation coming up next week. The dedication of Mary. If you go back to the Berkeley Monastery website, you'll see that on July 26th, that's 6:30 to 7:30, there'll be a Great Compassion Mantra recitation. Uh, other, let's all the regular activities are happening. As usual. Okay. You have to go to the just home homepage. Homepage. Yeah. Scroll down a little bit. Our regular events, and then. Okay. Down. Great compassion, dedication, merit. There it is, right there. Okay, last Sunday of the month, July twenty-sixth. Okay, this is all found on BerkeleyMonastery.org. Right, and there's a full schedule of Dharma events that people can participate in our online schedule, BBM online. Excellent. Thank you all for joining. Shall we do three half bows to the Buddha and then bows to Master Hua? Here we go. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. See you all next week. Omitofo.